Hi, everybody, and welcome uh, to the Gameplay Ability System. I'm Matt Edmonds, uh, speaker. A bit more about myself and the contributors in just a minute here. But uh, first, a little bit about where we are from, Splash Damage. Uh, our studio was founded by these three once young men. <laughs> That's Richard, Paul, and Arnott, respectively. These were the founders of the studio. Obviously, they're back at QuakeCon 2000 full of life and energy, as we all were back then. Uh, and this is our awesome studio and building in uh, Bromley, southeast London, on one of London's many, many sunny days. Plenty of sunny days. Uh, and for those who know um, Seattle back in the States or Hamburg in Germany, those are the two places I was before this. You might think I have a secret love for gray skies and clouds, but uh, they're all lovely cities like uh, Prague is as well. And quickly on that point, I've been dying to ask this, this whole convention, who, if anyone, is actually from or works here in Prague? Is anyone out there? Yes, great. Find me afterwards. We need uh, recommendations for restaurants. So <laughs> thank you, guys. I'm glad to see there are some natives here. Uh, but yeah, it's a, it's a great place, and London's been very nice to me since I've been there. I won't talk you through all of this. You guys can see it as it scrolls by, but this is uh, a lot of the background of splash damage. These guys are huge fans of these kinds of properties and obviously making our own games internally when we can, which is going to bring you to the parts here where uh, myself and the contributors uh, all came uh, to this talk from are these unannounced original IPs. So unfortunately, I can't really talk to you or show you directly, of course, what we're working on. We're all used to it. Uh, but again, working with Gears as they currently are and the recently announced uh, Master Chief Collection for PC. A lot of exciting stuff there. All Unreal, though. Every project in the uh, studio is using Unreal to one extent or other. So let me move past that here. About us, myself. Uh, it's, I stomped over my own uh, title with the logo, but... Uh, I'm Matt Edmonds, of course, again, uh, 19 years, over 19 years now, in uh, AAA games. So the younger people out there, watch out. It can go very fast in this industry. Uh, the better part of half of that is, has been in Unreal, and the better part of that half in UE4 for the last five years uh, since it launched. Right before starting at uh, Splash, I wrote an, uh, and published with Pact, uh, Mastering Game Development with Unreal Engine 4, the second edition. Um, and since then, of course, I've been a technical lead there uh, with the teams. And again, I'm not sure why my logos are all out of place. But one of our, um, one of our internal teams uh, benefited from Alejandro and Raghav, uh, this tech designer and programming pair, um, who did some of the talks, or some of the slides I'll present here today. And then Alberto, another one of our great tech designers, and Alvaro Sanchez, who's here somewhere. Um, worked with me on one of our other internal projects. And again, that's, uh, this talk is basically a distillation or, uh, to give you guys essentially a concentrated dose of what um, we did as four talks, three hours, with about an hour of kind of Q&A internally afterwards when we realized that all of our, uh, or not all of our, these, these two independent teams came to the same conclusion. We should be using the game playability system, or GAS. Um, and we're using it in a little bit different ways. We wanted to do some knowledge share. And then the next thing you know, I found myself roped into putting it all together to talk to you guys here at Unreal Fest. So uh, just quickly, for my benefit, again, who has used the gameplay ability system or is actively using it? Good amount of you. OK. Then some of this, uh, this will all probably be review in this first part. But um, the one thing I would encourage you to take away is the kind of benefits and the arguments that I'll, go, that I'll make in the second half, uh, these will help, I think, anybody to um, evangelize this to producers, financer, uh, financial groups, whatever. Uh, producers love pulling in a schedule. Financing loves pulling in you know, uh, budgets. If you need to make that argument and you're having a bit of difficulty selling this, even internally, some teams don't want to learn this. They have an easier way they think of doing these things. I'll try to help you with that part in the second half. First half, though, let's quickly jam through getting you up to speed with what gas is and what it does. So we'll go through some basic concepts, kind of show you guys the ropes with a quick heal ability, and then some advanced tips and things to consider um, that this uh, particular team came up with. 
as well as a few references, again, for those just getting started. Uh, you'll want to grab this slide later and check out those links uh, just to get some uh, good um, head start on the basics. And then, oops, glossed over that one, then sort of my contribution in a lot of ways is onto the value of using it uh, and comparing it to your other options. So what is GAS? An end-to-end -end system for programmers and designers making gameplay. And there's a couple of things to unpack there, so give me a second here. Um, Really, uh, the, the first is that to get the most out of it, to fully and properly utilize it, you are going to need to write some code. You can use some pieces of it. There's some parts that you can do blueprint only. But if you do that, you're really not getting the full benefit out of the system. You're just kind of taking advantage of, again, some of the blueprint implementation. Um, in addition, you're going to want to find what is that balance between you know, working with a designer and working with a programmer. How do we find what works for us, especially everyone's project's going to be different. So GAS is also uh, very easy to prototype with once you do understand it. So you can quickly do a lot with it once you are proficient. And that's a good thing. GAS is network ready, out of the box. It's built for multiplayer games. So most of the situations you can think of that you might have had to handle in the past, we'll talk about that a bit more. It's pretty well built in uh, to the concept to handle it. And again, it's easy for big teams to work on. So you're not working in like one megalithic blueprint or something like that. Um, you, you know, obviously we can merge code, but that means that you're only doing all of this work in code. As it is, it's pretty well distributed. You can work on individual pieces. Different people can check these things out, check them in, and you can build a lot of, like go broad very quickly, very easily. So some concepts. First thing you're gonna need to get to know is the uh, gameplay ability system component. Uh, and again, one important thing to remember from this, you can only add this guy from C++ right now. Uh, if you go looking for it in a blueprint to add it as a child component, you're going to find a couple related things, but not this guy. And this is the key to using it on your actors. And a gameplay ability, this is the, yeah, again, the logic uh, of a gameplay mechanic. But uh, again, as it was stated here in this slide for me, everything can be a gameplay ability. It's a little broad there, but it's really, the point is, is if you can think of something you want to do in gameplay, across almost any game that I imagine everyone out here is sitting there uh, uh, could think of that they're going to work on. Likely, almost certainly, you can do it through the gameplay ability system, and I'll try to show you why you probably should. So gameplay effects, these are what your gameplay ability sort of does to alter the world, uh, make things happen in that world. And you can think of them like a data asset. You're setting them up, you're firing them off, you're letting them do their job. Gameplay tags, these are used all over the place. Um, again, they're similar to actor tags. I'm sure everyone that uh, has probably not used uh, gas yet has probably seen it or at least utilized these. And uh, again, we can handle the uh, different uh, abilities and how they interact with each other. We'll go into this a bit more in the next section. I've got what I think is a pretty cool summary of these concepts too there. But attributes, again, just think health, damage, am I stunned? whatever it happens to be going on. And these are modified by those effects. And gameplay cues are what you're going to use for your visuals, your audio. Uh, and again, we'll show a quick example of triggering one of those off too, or how those are mapped, actually. So here in our uh, heal ability, let me check my time. Uh, again, you're adding um, a, a, an a attribute here in code. Next uh, macro, obviously, that you can see is just giving us some nice getters and setters. And then adding it to that actual actor. Once again, need to do it in code. But once you've actually added it in code, good news is you can kind of pass it off and let some, uh, hopefully, a designer, ours are usually technical designers, start working with that ability then uh, on the blueprint side, which is coming up. So. Uh, here is a very simple ability, which uh, is this heal over time. We'll get into the details of it in just a second here in the next slide or two. But uh, what this thing is doing, if you can see, this is the actual blueprint uh, event graph of the ability. So you make a uh, gameplay ability editor side, go into its event graph, you've got this activate ability. That activation can be associated with an input directly. Uh, so you can actually just, again, map those when you make the ability. Or you can trigger it off of anything else. I mean, 
my example always is like if, uh, if when you respawn, you get a 10 second invulnerability, uh, you have an XP boost for 30 seconds and a speed buff for some time. You can also trigger all of these in one simple way. Right here, we're at the activate part, but on the character with the component, you could simply say activate all of the abilities with the tag player.respawn. All of those will immediately fire for you. System handles it automatically. You can also activate abilities individually by the class, which is very similar to what's going on here with this effect. So when this ability fires, it's firing off one effect from its class on its target, then it ends. <laughs> so this is about as simple of an actual ability as you're probably going to see. But let's check out, though, what that effect is doing. This is kind of where the magic happens. So at the top here, you can see, OK, we've got a duration. <laughs> That can be instant, infinite, or an actual duration. In this case, we picked a duration. If you can read that, well, yeah, it's, it's a pretty big screen. I hope you guys can read it. Uh, and we said, let this thing last for three seconds. Then what's, its, what's it doing? It's got a modifier down there, and that modifier is going to add to health 0.2, uh, uh, along with a curve table that sort of defines what, again, these, these kind of values map to, adding health over that three seconds. So the modifiers, though, and you're going to see this in a lot of places, and I'm going to reference it quite a bit in the next minute or so. Uh, you've got the uh, tags. In this case, um, requires tags, uh, ignore tags. <laughs> Required tags, in this case, is on the source. I'm the one producing this effect. If I don't have all the, the required tags on myself, it fails. The, the effect doesn't happen. If I have any of the ignore tags, Effect fails, doesn't happen. Similarly, you can do the exact same thing for the target. If it requires having certain tags, if those aren't there, the effect doesn't do anything. If it's got any of the ignore tags, effect doesn't do anything. So you can really gate these things, again, based on immunities and, uh, again, if, if you want to block stacking and all sorts of things, it's definitely all ready to go. But next one here, there's a, a a really important section on your effects for, again, managing all of these different tags. And just to make sure I don't forget anything, uh, the granted tags, actually, the, the first ones here, gameplay tags, are those of the effect. So this gameplay effect has tags associated with it. So obviously, you can imagine um, something like uh, there's an ability that blocks healing. If somebody throws that on you, you've got an effect running that is healing, uh, or sorry, then someone tries to put an effect with healing on you, it's not going to happen. Uh, so again, you can gate all of that behavior. Um, but really, this one, getting ahead of myself, this one is to say, what tags do I associate with? And if, spoilers, we jump ahead to the very bottom line, there's the remove gameplay effects with tags. That's a way, of course, of saying, when this effect happens, everybody with the things I say I should remove, I clear off. So again, buffs or debuffs or whatever, there's all kinds of uses of these uh, in different types of games. But going back through them in order, the granted tags are, these are tags that I put onto whoever I'm affecting. So while I'm affecting this actor, you gain these tags. And what else we got is the ongoing tag requirements. Uh, similarly, if, if you have to have one of these tags or you must not have one of the ignore tags, if any of those breaks, the way to consider this one is that it won't remove your effect. It's just going to disable it. Your effect stops doing anything, having any effect, no pun intended, on your actor uh, if one of these um, ongoing tag requirements uh, blocks it. Uh, but it remains on there, so if that tag then disappears, it once again will continue uh, affecting as normal. And application tag requirements, that's this effect when I'm applied. If I require things on who I'm applied to, once again, check. Uh, and Or again, if I'm supposed to be ignored, if other tags are on me, check all of those when I'm applied and fail if any of those are set for this entire effect. So you got the ones for individual modifiers up above, and you can add a whole bunch of modifiers. These ones are for the entire effect itself. So you got a lot of control as long as you're willing to take the time, learn how all this works. 
So our Q, this is another one where again, I think if you're looking at this, at least it's big enough that you guys can kind of read it and see a little bit of what's going on there. Uh, the editor you'll find under Windows in the Gameplay Q editor. One thing I didn't uh, mention that I really should have off of the, uh, the top. All of this is made available if you, just, if you go into your plugins, go find Gameplay Abilities, click the checkbox, voila. It's been experimental for about a year, but if you've you know, played certain games like Paragon or Fortnite, you might have heard of it, uh, they're using this. They're using this internally everywhere they can, uh, Epic is. And so when they found out we were using it too, just because we kind of came to our own conclusions, it's part of the reason why I'm standing here in front of you guys right now. Uh, but the, this editor becomes available once the plugin is installed, just from, again, window, go find that gameplay queue editor. And what you're doing here is associating tags with these uh, uh, handlers. Again, it's just more um, uh, basically br blueprints that you can do what you need to do in there. But this is where you'll add, again, all of your visual effects, all of your audio, and as you can kind of see here, you can specify that as this happens when it's applied, this is ongoing while it's on me, you know, while active, um, or here's something specific I want to do when I'm actually removed. So again, all your visuals and audio are here. The only kind of problem, and there's a bullet point coming up about this, is again, it's all in this sort of flat list, which isn't the easiest thing if, once you scale up and get a lot of these, but it works. It does what you need it to do. So some tips from the guys. You can handle cooldowns very easily through tags. Um, and again, read that out to your UI. Just say, hey, this ability is on cooldown for six seconds, and you know, tick down your uh, UI like you guys would all expect. You can set immunity, like I said, and say, uh, while this is active on this guy, they can't be stunned, or they can't be healed, or you know, all those different things you'd expect from like MOBAs and MMOs and uh, lots of these types of games. But um, also, again, works perfectly good for shooters where, like I said, as soon as you respawn, don't let people spawn camp you. Just give them a three-second immunity so you have a chance to go find some cover. Uh, gameplay effects, these can be stacked as well. Uh, one point I like to point out is you can also prevent stacking with this. So you could say anytime a heal, healing ability is added to somebody, it removes all other heal tagged abilities. So you only have ever one of them active. But again, if you like, you can, uh, of course, add as many as you want. And gameplay tasks, which we'll go into in the next section a little bit more, um, do asynchronous work for you. So get ready for that. There's definitely a way you can say, go churn on something and get back to me in the blueprint side whenever this finishes. And if you do get some complicated uh, attribute calculations, you can always override this in code. So they give you the option, which, uh, you know, always nice. Now, <laughs> this is a theme that will keep coming up, and hopefully I explain it well. And if not, anybody just come find me, and I'll do my best to say, here's our experiences with it. Uh, for those that haven't been already through this, there is a considerable learning curve, um, especially, you know, again, uh, content side, a lot of designers are not used to working like this, per se. Um, any of us can probably, r right now, that are doing a job making gameplay, can know a way we can get stuff into a game. We all have some tools and abilities to get stuff in there. The trick is here that you're going to have to invest and see, okay, how did they set this, the gameplay ability system up? How do all of these different things interact? How does this scale when I have hundreds of abilities and they're all putting different tags on people? And what happens when one of them doesn't work the way I expect? It's a lot of uh, uh, things that you're going to have to manage and internally take in, but Hopefully, I make the point by the end here that it's worth it. And speaking of, <laughs> there's lots of files. So as you get all of these effects, get all of these attributes, get all of these different uh, pieces all working together, it's a little, it can get easy to get lost. So you're working in one single ability. You think you've got it all figured out. Something goes wrong, and you're like, oh, god, where was that other effect? Or, oh, it's not reacting well with this one that I set up that you didn't expect them to have a conflict. But again, because of the tags you set up or something. They do. So there's a bit of overhead there, but to me, that's going to happen in any game where you have dozens or hundreds of abilities like this. Uh, the gameplay queue, uh, as I pointed out, I think uh, already is a little bit rough, but again, it works, gets the job done. 
And communication between gas and non-gas systems is generally one way. That's the best way I can put it. Gas is perfectly happy to kind of start things, listen for things, wait for things, um, tell you when something has happened. But if you're going to try to say, oh, is gas running? Like, is there an ability? Oh, I want to see that ability. And I want to inject that this should change. No, just, just don't. <laughs> you're not doing yourself any favors to try to dig in like that. Um, and again, here are these references that I'll give a second here for pictures, of course, but naturally these slides will get posted, so uh, you can hopefully get a less shaky cam version of this uh, after today. Okay. So now we'll change gears a bit, and again, I'm going to compare with alternatives so that you guys, whatever project you're working on, whatever studio you're at, you can make the right decision for you, I hope based on some of our experiences that I can share here. First thing, though, is, again, a practical real-world example of what did we do where we could see it one way, see it the other way. And then, uh, in this case, that's a reloadability. I'll walk you through it as if we didn't use gas, here's how we would do it, and here's basically how anybody would do it, as far as I can tell, at kind of a high level. And then we'll say, OK, now, with gas, and let's just break down what happened between the two real quick. And then, here's the part with cost-benefit analysis, which you know, sounds like producer speak, but it's not boring, I promise. This is sort of my most direct contribution to this, the slides I actually uh, had to put together myself from scratch, instead of sort of absorbing and uh, modifying to share out here in this condensed form. But we'll compare my experiences working on a couple other AAA games where we did this ourselves, and what did I learn that hopefully maybe you don't have to. We'll do a little bit of wrap-up, then everybody can go get some coffee for the last afternoon sessions. So without gas, what would you typically do when you're starting? You're waiting for an input. You get an input activated event somewhere, your character, whoever is doing this. And that uh, triggers your set of logic. But first, of course, you're going to have to say, can I do this on the client? So your client is saying, do I have the ammo? Am I doing something else important? Does this make sense? And then you're also going to have to figure out at this stage who's responsible for that. Do you want gameplay programmers doing all this stuff where something, you know, again, we're trying to do a gameplay ability, for lack of a better word. I mean, we're trying to do something in the game. Uh, who's responsible for saying, yep, we can do it or no? And again, do you expose this to designers? Do you put it in blueprints? Who's gating this? Somebody's got to be responsible. Once you decide on the client, yep, we're good to go. You're going to have to send something to your server in a multiplayer game. Hey, by the way, I'm doing this thing. Change the, game, the state of the game for everybody else that's playing. So you can send an RPC. Then you either wait for a response, which none of us do, because all of us hate lag in games. Normally, you just proceed assuming it's going to work, and then you deal with it if it doesn't. But that's really the crux of this first thing we'll get to at the end. And so again. Uh, Wait, if you happen to be firing at the moment, somebody tries to trigger a reload, still going to have to wait for that animation to finish. Um, again, you can just there's a number of ways you can gate on this. Pick yours. But then, of course, once you actually start the reload, you're going to have to pre prevent firing at that point. So again, they don't interrupt or do something they're not allowed to in the game. So you just set a flag or do whatever works for you. Play the animation montage. You know, we're doing our thing getting our ammo put in. And then uh, either you're going to need a callback or a timer or just wait a certain amount of time, whatever, again, your preferred method is. I usually actually do like to set timers. I'm a little paranoid about animation events, especially if you put them right at the very end. I've just had too many years with Unreal where they, you play through the animation. And every once in a while, it seems like it just misses that animation event at the very end of the animation. If you're going to use animation events, pull it in a bit. Just my little piece of advice there. Uh, so whatever works for you, that guys, though, you say, OK, at this point um, in this bit of gameplay, we're actually popping the ammo into the gun. It's officially reloaded, no going back. This gameplay change has happened. And again, uh, now you need to actually wait for that animation itself to finish, because whatever else you do after the counter increases and whatever, now you're back to some animation state. Same kind of thing. Re-enable your firing on the client. You're now allowed to shoot again. 
Here's the thing, though. And again, everybody probably who's worked on a multiplayer game like this has probably dealt with this scenario. What happens when you told the server, hey, the client looks good, I'm going to reload now, OK? Wait a few hundred milliseconds, whatever. Client com or the server comes back and is like, no, 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 no. Looking at what I'm seeing, you're, you can't reload. <sighs> the server's going to say, no, I, I've, I've, I've rejected this. I'm not going to do it. And your state is not going to change. Now it's all up to you on your client side to figure out what does that mean. OK, great. Uh, it's, it's a pain. And it, again, everybody can do it in different ways. But when that stage fails, the red block, uh, it's annoying. So do we wait before you actually do it, make any visual changes? Again, like actually incrementing your counter uh, to hear back from the server? How long do you wait? What if you don't hear back from the server? Uh-oh. Uh, do you rewind and rubber band? And we all love this in games where you think you're doing a thing, and then all of a sudden you find out you're about a half a second earlier because you didn't do that thing. Feels horrible as a player. Uh, not my favorite. And again, what if you try to, st you're going to have to handle what happens if you try to start shooting while you're in the middle of a reload? What happens if you try to reload when you're in the middle of a reload? You know, it's all on you to handle all of those edge cases that there's probably a dozen more that aren't going to make that list. So let's try this again with gas and just see what it gets us. First, you can automatically and intrinsically associate the reload with an input. You just build the ability and you say, based when this input happens, you execute your ability. It's nice. Uh, and again, that's all done for you. Good way to think about tags is think of them like conditions. It's most of the way that we use them. You can use them for all kinds of other things, but that's really the easiest, uh, most general case is while I'm doing this, don't, let me, uh, don't allow me to do this. When I'm doing that, don't do this. If I'm not doing this, also don't allow me to do that. So again, they're great for gating all of these things in one place. So you can kind of look at them and see, if any of these is happening, don't let those other things happen. Uh, and also, uh, if you need to do something really specific, you can always override can activate ability. It's good to know, too. It's in there. So now what happens when we want, again, from the client side, once again, say, yep, looks like we should be able to do a reload. Create a prediction key. These things, again, are built into the system. They're there here. They're there to save you from all the problems I was just talking about. Send that PK to the server associated with this ability. Say, by the way, server, here's my PK. Here's the thing I'm trying to do. Let me know what happens. And the server will activate the ability locally you know, with its uh, uh, simulated version of your actor and see how it goes. Server can come back to you and say, yep, I've caught up, and it all looks good. Or I can say, no, I tried to do this, and for whatever reason on my server state, this ain't going to happen. And again, there's um, plenty of little output things in Blueprint, which you can use then to actually interrupt this, handle it however you want. Uh, but in this case, one thing we're doing uh, that we were doing before, if we're in the middle of shooting, how do we wait? Well, let's just set one of these uh, ability tasks in there that says, hang out here until this ability tag is removed. Because, oh, hey, we're in the middle of firing. Great. OK, well, wait until firing tag gets off, then continue on and begin the montage, animation montage and start the actual reload. And here, uh, we're using a gameplay effect um, and applying a tag, of course, that uh, actually, in this case, it's that we're firing, but, um, or sorry, to inhibit firing is what I mean. Um, so going forward, no more shooting. And so you do that, as, of course, as soon as you start this reload. And again, also associate all of this with your prediction key. It's very straightforward to actually do in the system. The animation, yeah, is then uh, played by another task. So another nice asynchronous task. We just say, OK, kick off this montage. Tell me when it's done, or not even tell me when it's done. This one actually just uh, lets you play, because we're going to wait for an event. Um, with another ability uh, task, which just sits there and spins until, ah, by the way, uh, I just found out that uh, from a, again, a, a, sorry, animation uh, trigger that, by the way, you're now reloading or reloaded. Change your ammo using, uh, change the attribute, of course, using another gameplay effect. If you guys, once again, hopefully uh, this is big enough, you can see. Here we're just saying, what's, what's my current ammo? Set it up to 30. There you go. 
And again, the animation is still being played uh, by that task. And it will tell you, by the way, I'm, I'm done, or I got interrupted, or yeah, again, all, it handles all the cases there for you. So if you need to do something specific, uh, again, play a hit reaction, force yourself back into a base state, sort of an idle or whatever, it's all there for you. But normally, of course, again, you're just going to finish your animation montage and move on. Oops. And, and again, re-enabling firing is going to happen also right here, because we're taking one stack of inhibited firing off when we finish uh, reloading. So that automatically lets you start shooting again. And again, let's compare our uh, two graphs here. So again, we're going along. We send off the prediction key. We're still doing some things on the client side, maybe this montage, et cetera, et cetera. Oh, no, we rejected that key. Well, on the server side, it ends. You're not going to get your reload done. It comes back and tells you uh, with events, or you know, with the um, reply from the uh, prediction key, by the way, nope, didn't work, and automatically removes all of the effects and prevents all of that on the client. So it just basically cleans itself up by default. If there's different things that you want to do when that happens, you can hook into that. But it's pretty well handled out of the box. So again, with gas, overall structure looks kind of similar. Uh, of course, you're doing, again, the same things. You're trying to reload. You're trying to play an animation, trying to make it look right on the client and make sure it is legal with the server. Um, but with gas, again, this is a bit more declarative. It, it, for those of you that work with kind of declarative systems, you'll probably know what I'm talking about. If you don't, just kind of summarize. You set up your, what you expect to happen. You set up everything the way you think it ought to go. You push it off to the system, and then you just let it do what it does. And the good news is, again, Epic's using this on shipped titles. Uh, others are using it. You've got the support of the community. You've got tools. You've got people you can ask. It's a lot better than trying to figure all this stuff out on your own if something ever goes wrong. And if you ever find a bug, make a pull request. Get it to the rest of us. And so here's my summary of all of these things that hopefully is a bit helpful for you guys, again, new to it, to wrap your heads around it. Tags for me are the if. Attributes here are uh, the what. What is changing? What am I, what's the gameplay effect that's getting altered um, through this process? The effects themselves are essentially your how. How is this changing? Oh, by this amount at this time. Uh, the tasks that you can, uh, asynchronous tasks you can set up are sort of the win. So let, let this go by and seven, or not, you know, seven hundredths of, or seven tenths of a second later, chick, you actually have reloaded. And the abilities themselves are the why. What said I should do this? So as I put it, if, what, how, when, why? all in a row. So hopefully, that kind of makes it clear. These are how you use these things. They're all there. They work. The system is really robust. It's pretty darn powerful. But it does look like, if you looked at the, that graph that I showed you, like there's just more stuff going on. But really, again, it's more options and safety. They're trying to keep a server multiplayer based multiplayer game from having the problems that we've all had doing this ourselves, and I know I have. Uh, interruption, server rejection, stacking, or not, all of these things are built in. They're there for you. you. You can just explore a bit. You'll find them. They work. And if you build one ability, <laughs> the first method, you get one ability. If you take the time and actually learn gas, you've got a lifetime of building abilities. So it's the teach a fish, yeah, give a fish, teach a fish thing. Um, but it really is true. You can carry this forward from your own projects internally to new projects, or God forbid any of you ever move to a different studio, you could take it there and make the argument, we should be using this, and here's why. Because you're familiar with it, you've seen what it can do. And real quick now, I'm going to jam through, let's compare these to the real world cases in my life and why I'm convinced. Hopefully you guys will be too, but make up your own minds. So gas versus not. The two examples that I'm going to walk you guys through here uh, from my background was Guardians of Middle Earth uh, in 2010, 2011. Uh, WB came to us and said, hey, we need a game for the Hobbit movie. Can you guys, you're pitching a MOBA in Lord of the Rings. Can you jam that out in Monolith Tech in 18 months? And the three of us were like, yes, just give us a team. We can find a way to make it happen. And we did. 
Uh, but that was the first person in Shooter Engine, and I was the one responsible for writing all of this gameplay side. Uh, Gates of Epica was what I was working on most recently before um, the book and coming to uh, Splash Damage, and was a, meant to be a AAA experience brought through UE4, two players on mobile, uh, launched in Europe um, for about a year before they shut it down as InnoGames went back to strategy games. So if you try to find it now, uh, you won't really be able to find some videos. We did a lot of cool stuff, but it was a lot of effort. So let's compare this to the internal work our two teams were doing and the pace they were on, well, are on uh, for actually getting comparable work done on a AAA game. So there's a bunch of little numbers over here behind me. Um, you can trust my math. The thing I'm going to focus on right here um, when we were making a MOBA in Lord of the Rings uh, setting was, uh, I mean, we pitched it as uh, it's League of Legends in Lord of the Rings. And they were like, great, go do it. Um, we took their first-person shooter engine and said, OK, we've got to figure out how to make this happen. There were a lot of challenges. A lot of, I could spend a lot of time talking about this one. But we did get it out on time, Xbox and PlayStation. And later, some other guys ported it to PC. The one thing to think about, or two things to think about, rather, I'm going to be talking about the unique character abilities, sort of the unique gameplay abilities, both player and NPCs. Um, and that, in this case, was 88. But all of these things had to be modified by hundreds of potions, power-ups, boosts, all of that fun stuff. Um, all of these things had to be accounted for and tracked as, you know, again, uh, buffs that stack and uh, all those fun things in a MOBA. Uh, totally forgot to actually go over the numbers. So when you see P slash D, that's programmer and design times. Um, I usually, again, since I don't have exact numbers, but I did live all of this, um, I always give estimates in a low and a high, confident that somewhere in the middle is the uh, actual truth. So hopefully in here, again, you guys can see that uh, prototyping was not too bad, especially for me. I just sort of banged this out, and we had some style sheet type things in Monolith's editor. I just said, OK, uh, here's some conditions, and then here's some effects, and here's a timer delay, and here's a next condition and next effect. And by the way, play this animation when you do it. I set that up relatively quickly, got it to work, but getting a designer up to speed on it took some time. Had a great designer on that project who did a ton of work and was amazing. But um, again, you can see how much time we spent debugging all the rest of it. The number I'm going to emphasize here and going forward, you're probably already seeing where this is going. How much of that effort were we able to take into future projects? None. It's all in that game, and then it's gotten kind of thrown away ever since. Gates, again, we wanted a Diablo-style game with a big five-zone single-player experience, asynchronous but partially synchronous uh, boss battles with you know raid-style boss battles where you could join all your friends, you take on this boss for a day-long fight, uh, and use more unique abilities. And again, you have to trust me on those numbers, 162 abilities between the NPCs, the unique players, and the bosses that we actually put into that game. The one number, I don't have a laser pointer thinger, but the one number I would point out with my finger here, that 52 to 56 is pretty tight. And I know that because I pitched originally something similar to what I did in uh, Guardians of Middle Earth. But it was rejected because we didn't have any designers that could actually use a tool that I would provide them to go broad. We just didn't have designer bandwidth. So one of the guys on my team, fell on this sword and volunteered. He said, I bet I could just do this with like blueprints and maybe some C++ switching back and forth. Uh, design will just tell me what they want. I'll code it up, basically, and then we'll do these however many we need. And we needed 162. So it was a year of his life doing nothing but this. As you can probably guess, he was a little burnt out by the end of that and never wants to do anything like this again. And I told him up front, I said, if you're really sure, <laughs> Go for it, but know what you're committing yourself to, because it's just a huge amount of work. And that was literally all he got to work on for a solid year. Poor guy. Whew. Thanks, Andre. Uh, so what reuse did we get out of that? Well, there's a little asterisk, as you can see over there. And uh, really, we learned just how much work this really does take if you're going to do it yourself with gating the stuff, C++, back and forth to Blueprint. We're going to have to put some delays in. We're going to have to pass control of who's doing what in this flow and take care of that all over a network uh, as well. Um, so 
What were we on track for for doing this in our gas games? Again, I can't really specifically speak to what those were, but there's a lot of action and you know, some co-op and killing different large things or fighting, you know, again, huge enemies and things. Okay, can't really go into those details. But uh, for a similarly scoped, I'm just going to kind of split the difference for sake of argument. Uh, we put in here 120 unique abilities, and again, any of those genres, I am happy to argue with any of you guys that this is probably your best choice. If you're making a small puzzle game with three mechanics, then just do it however you want. But if you're getting up into that 120 kind of number, you're probably going to want to switch over and start learning this. So uh, the prototypes you're going to notice here, the prototype numbers are a bit higher and there's a bit of a range. Kind of depends on how tech savvy your designers are, uh, how quickly your programmers kind of pick up the um, concept of I'm sort of building out the framework, then I'm passing it off to a designer. Then I'm sort of building out some framework, then passing it off to a designer. So you've got to get a little bit of that setup done on the programming side, but once you're used to this cadence, you can pass those off quickly. Designers can tweak everything very quickly, iterate it very quickly into the game. So expect that, though, that you're going to take some time to actually have to learn this and start getting it right, figure out what works for you guys. But um, as you probably can guess, those low-end and high-end numbers that we're tracking uh, for scheduling are actually both pulled in. It's a summary of this in the next slide. And look at that. You can take whatever you did and learned, as well as the actual assets from prototype into your production, from shipping a game into the sequel. All of this stuff carries on, as, and as well as people debugging it, learning the tips and tricks. How do we figure out when something went wrong? What do we do about it? So here's the big reveal. Again, as you can see, oops, sorry, as you can see, uh, the low and high end both pulled in quite a bit for us uh, on our schedules when we were tracking these uh, compared to what I've done in the past. There is a bit of that unpredictability as you start to learn, like, how do we debug when something goes wrong? You're going to have to learn a couple of techniques of your own that, again, help you guys figure out where those problems are. And it's, of course, easy for multiple designers to be working on similar things and one stomps on the other's foot, but there you go. Um, ready for, again, the big <laughs> reveal. You will get to reuse this not just on this project, on your next project, throughout your studio. You can start sharing it like we did. Take it forward. Like I said, inject it now. Sooner the better. You're going to, I think, convince me if I'm wrong, I think you're going to uh, believe that that was the right decision. So just a real quick wrap up. And like I said, uh, we're hitting coffee, I think, after that. But I'll be around. And uh, myself and Alvaro are here. Uh, look for me in the blue shirt. I'm happy to answer any questions, deep dive any of this. I have the original four um, talks that we did internally as well, including like a chaining melee attack. If you want to see how that was implemented, we actually have videos and animation that I couldn't put up here on the big screen. But I'm happy to share those with you guys. So GAS gives us this framework, lets you go broad. It's great for that. The community and obviously the biggest ship title right now, all are using it. So you know it's got support. Uh, do you have to use it? Of course not. Something else works better for you guys? Pfft, you know, obviously I'm not here to uh, force you to try to twist your arm. I'm just telling you, here's where our experience is, and hopefully you make a similar decision, because the more people using this, the better. Knowing its capabilities, again, allows you to make those decisions. You can go to a producer. You can go pitch this project internally. You can go pitch this project to external publishers, whoever you got to do, and sell them on it. You can say, we know how to do this. We can predict it's going to take two program gameplay programmers, two designers, and in eight months, we're going to have all this gameplay that we're promising. You'll know that. So again, for me, that's just huge. And again, solves a lot of problems that I, for one, would rather not keep solving again. Been there, done that, would rather let Epic do it. Thank you guys for that. And one last bonus, the gas jokes never get old. You can use those forever. So. Thanks for watching, and like I said, we're right at the time limit, but come find us, talk to us.